editing really helped you once you started directing in terms of knowing what you needed and what you didn't need and being economical and how you shot? Totally, because I did my first feature in 13 days. And um, that was, you know, uh, astonishing to be able to remember, okay, I got this in the two shot. Since we don't have any time left, I, I got it in the two shot. I'll be able to cut the scene. You know, you know what I'm saying? I was yeah. able to like figure it in my head and go, okay, I got the scene. Well, maybe I could have done better. I could have had more choices, but I got it. And we need to move, so good, let's yeah. go, right? But sometimes, I mean, like Francis, for example, he doesn't overshoot, but he likes to explore sometimes. And I think that's an interesting thing where he will, you know, maybe try the scene in different little changes or big changes. So, could be with the camera a little bit, it could be with the actors as they are doing it, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. there is sometimes a sense of exploration. That I find very, very interesting way of working. But of course he has budget and time. Because things happen, you know, with actors. You know, get looser, an idea comes, you know. So it would always tell me one thing, match up, meaning you have to go with the best take in this. If the best moment is like this, then all the other stuff, no matter if it was done, thinking of another take with a different matching, yeah. you follow me? Or with the continuity. And yeah, the yeah. continuity. So because let's say, you know, they had, they had done all this shot uh, with the person lifting your glass on such and such line, right? Now they go to a different shot and suddenly something happened. They come up with a new idea on how to do it and she's now going to be standing up when she's grabbing the glass, right? So, but if this is better, you have to match up, meaning you have to make it work. You can't just bring down the quality or the idea just because. So that's kind of interesting, you know, it's a challenge. You have to figure it out, how can you do that? So yeah. editors have to find a lot of solutions like that. Also too, um, do you ever find when you're, when you're editing or even when you're directing that, um, you know, as we say, like the page a minute uh, theory, that if the actors sort of push up their pace and do the scene faster, that sort of helps. Um, that sort of helps the movie flow. That helps the scene flow. That helps everything. I don't know. I think sometimes we directors have actors move too slowly, and that kind of drags the pace a little bit. Or yeah, well, I mean, it depends on the subject matter, right? I mean, yeah. sometime uh, like on Iron Wheel, for example, Jack was very methodical, very slow. I mean, he was playing a guy, um, you know, who had um, dropped his child by accident when he was drunk and killed him, and, and he was like walking around like a bum because he was so and guilty. hallucinating and uh, yeah, he yeah. was you know so so you know like like how do you you know. You have to have that kind of a performance. You can't suddenly go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so he's going to deliver his line in a certain way. So that's a challenge for an editor too, so that you you keep you know the meaning and the meat of the performance without you know letting the movie. Um, and that was really a difficult thing to be seen on this film, not for Jack, but because the director had done it all of, you know, he had, he had kind of given that pace to things he could have maybe made a little snap here. So anyway. the movie could have sort of been... I think I think uh, that was one of the challenges of this film, that sometimes the, the pacing, you know, yeah. was, it was not, you know, I really believe that all great films have a variety of rhythms. You know, you can't be like me. Ta -ta 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 -ta. You have to always, I think, keep them on their toes, and you have to change the rhythm. I think scenes should have different rhythms. Yeah, that's my idea. Almost finding the right pace for the yeah. right moments, yeah. and not having everything sort of yeah. be at one. Yeah, and surprise them. So, like you know, in music, you have an adagio, and you have a you know, so you you know you 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 give them those different rhythm. I think it keeps them you know glued to the screen. Yeah. Right. Um, I was going to ask you about um, Hector Babenko, who directed Iron Weed. Right. Um, I think before that he had done uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Yes. He was nominated for uh, Best Director at the Oscars. And um, what was his working process like? Was he uh, similar to Coppola or, or Nicholson in terms of giving you freedom to to work or? Well, at first, at first, because he came from Brazil, so he's Argentinian. Um, he was. He didn't want me to cut at first. When I was on location, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. He didn't want me to cut. He was so nervous that <laughs> I was going to screw up his film. So um, I forgot exactly how we solved it. I think maybe I cut something and I showed it to him, and everything went smoothly. But he he would be you know he would come every Saturday to look at what I'd done. Uh, he was a little more nervous about, you know, but we, 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 we got along really well. There was no problem. Once he, you know, I think once, it's always the first time when they don't know you and you don't know them. It's always, a, you know, that's the beauty of working with somebody twice or three times because then you know them better. And so you don't have that anxiety, of, you know. Yeah. They, also, you have confidence because they, they, they have really hired you. That means they like your work, Right. Yeah. So you start on a different footing and then when you're brand new with somebody, right? So, but, you know, once once I started to work, Babenko was fine. But at first he was very nervous, yes. And then he, he kind of, uh, that was an interesting, um, I mean, I bless him because that's how I got to know Jack, really. Yeah. Um, because uh, after we had done a cut, he had to go to Brazil for something. And he told me, um, I want Jack to do a cut of the film. It's fine, do it. I'm, 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 I'm giving you the green light to do it. Um, and if I don't like it, I'll put it all so back. So this was you and Jack Nicholson uh, right. working in the editing room. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, I mean, I was like, as an editor, you hate this situation. This is like your most dreaded situation. Even Nicholson or the Pope. You just really do not want to be in this position, okay? Because, no. So anyway, so I was very nervous, not about the fact that it was Jack Nicholson, but about the situation, right? So, um, but, you know, Babenko said, do it. So if he says, do it, then that's a different story. It's not like the producer yeah. telling you to do something in the back of the director. Yeah. It's the director it's telling you. permission. Yeah, the director is saying, I, I want you to do it, it's fine. I, um, and they did have a great relationship, by the way, Jack and Babenko. But that was really an incredible film. And, you know, it's not always brought up with, you know, people think of Nicholson, Cuckoo's Nest, and uh, in terms of endearments. Chinatown. Five Easy Pieces. That's such an incredible... It was only on DVD, I think, a few years ago. They finally released it, but... Um, he got an Academy Award nomination yeah, for it. Meryl Streep, too, I yeah, think, was, yeah, uh, was nominated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's how I got to know Jack, and, um, you know, I did a cut. I mean, he came for two days, and then he called me from his house, because it's the same thing, I think. Once they know that you know what you're doing, they don't need to sit there. They find that extremely boring. I would, too. <laughs> you know? So we w I would just do stuff, and we talk, and, you know, and then he would come back. i show him my stuff, and that's how we did it. And in the end, I don't remember exactly how much of it we saved or we put back, you know, honestly. Once we were, everybody was cool about everything, it was not a matter of, prop, you know, propriety. I mean, I, I don't think that way. Like, oh, this is my stuff. Why are we changing it? It's not my stuff anymore. Oh, this was my cut. You know, I don't, I don't even remember often what was my idea. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's just... You know, it gets in the mix with every with the director usually, but in this case, more than one uh, person. And I just don't, I don't, I, I'm not like, I don't like hold on to something. Oh, that was mine. I just don't think like that. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have an ego, of course. Yeah, but <laughs> what benefits the, uh, what benefits the film? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Well, if it works, you know, like who cares where it came from? And so often in a film. Um, you know, one idea over here, then it gets, you know, aggregated with this idea over here, then it comes back over there, and then, duh, 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 and then boom, another idea comes back. Whose idea it is? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It goes through this kind of constant, because it's creativity, so, you know, like Jack uh, Francis used to say, oh, I, I love what you do, even if I think it's crazy. <laughs> because even if it's crazy, then I have an idea. And I think that's what you and like. And I can generate another idea. Exactly. Bringing something exactly. Else. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you never know how it's going to go. Um, that's why you have to dare. You have to dare try anything. Yeah. Even, you know, if you think, oh, it's not kosher, it's not really the way it should be done, it looks a little silly, but what if... And so what if can bring ideas? So most recently you've uh, delved into uh, working on documentaries uh, as well as directing. 
And um, are you, you're also editing the documentary you're working on now as well? Yes. Uh, it's called A Classy Broad. Marsha Nassato is the subject of the film, and she was the first woman uh, vice president in charge of production uh, at United Artists in the 70s when they were making, you know, like Rocky, Cuckoo's Nest. They didn't make Cuckoo's Nest, they distributed it. Um, Coming Home. Coming Home, yeah. Uh, yeah. Apocalypse Now was UA. So just a great, uh, you know, and she was, you know, like one of the two people making the decision on the West Coast. Of course, it's, it was a East Coast company, so they always had to get, but they were the one deciding on which, you know, which script, which, which they would decide on the director, writer, you know, the, the, the main people, the main cast. And of course, they always needed the approval from, from New York. But uh, so she did that, but she also produced, you know, she went on to have a huge career. She also produced uh, The Big Chill. She got it made when nobody wanted to make that film. She did, you know, she was a producer on Iron Weed. She was a producer on uh, Hamburger Hill. Plus she had other executive job uh, through the years. But she's a very interesting woman. She also, in her 80s, with a very uh, wonderful writer called Lorenzo Sample, who, um, you know, wrote like Three Days of the Condor, Parallax View, unfortunately it just died, but they had a show called Real Geezers on uh, YouTube, which was quite popular. They would review movies, uh, and they were, it was very cantankerous, and so they would fight. It was a Lorenzo Sample yeah. and... Uh... And Marsha Oh, wow, I have to check that out. Yeah, Real Geezers, yeah. So she she's just a very creative, uh, wonderful woman who, who just has a wonderful spirit, and I thought she would be a very interesting. It would be to do a movie about Hollywood, but not about the stars and the you know, but people who are very very important and are functioning. A human story in Hollywood that does not involve super famous, uh, super everything. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think I think we have a very nice film. I think. Um, she was an, I mean, obviously from the geezers I knew she was very good with camera. She didn't seem inhibited at all. Plus she has been taking acting lessons in her, yeah. in her <laughs> 80s. And she was marvelously natural. She, she really was a great creative partner. Um, she understood what I was trying to do. She had written a book that's not published and she had done an oral, oral history for the Academy so I had a lot of nowhere for thirty years, but also I had a lot of information to really study her life and decide what I was going to do, right? And one of the ideas I had was to create scenes that would link different periods of our life where we could go from one. So it's not like just interviews, yes. right? So it's a very I don't know. Sort of archive uh, photography and well, no, stuff. not too much. But for example, to give an example to tie the narrative of one period of her life to another without having people tell you, tell you, tell you, but c come up with scenes. Like, for example, I knew there was a fur coat that she, she had bought with a bonus from UA, right, when she was an executive there. And that fur coat was linked to the end of her job at UA. So there was, if you brought the fur coat and did something, that could lead you to tell the story of the yeah. end of UA. And I, that's what I tried to do with a lot of the scene in our life. In a way, creating scenes based on the truth of our life. Uh, which, you know, I, don't, I think it's successful. I don't know how original it is, but that was my idea. Was there something uh, that surprised you about her? That um, you had no idea when, once you were sort of getting into the, into the well, I process? Well, th I think that the, what surprised me... Well, first, the, the fact that she understood exactly what I was trying to do in every scene and could provide a lot by being a, a very good creative partner. She got what... It was like working with a good actor, only she was the one who would... Because it's her life, right? Yeah. So I would suggest what we should be talking about, but she had to say it, so it had to be her own words, right? I was not going to tell somebody to speak about themselves with my own words. <laughs> with an accent, too. <laughs> Please. So, we had a great... Plus, she's somebody who was story, 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 story. You know, she was a famous book editor in New York. She was an executive that was reading thousands of scripts and deciding which one is going to go. So, she has a great sense of story. 
So she was a great partner in understanding what a scene is about and what we should deliver in that scene, you know. So, yeah. yeah. And it's really, uh, you know, those are the people who green light projects, yes. these executives. that's what she did. Know, people really don't, um, you know, they see, well, the producer does this and that, but the executives are, you know, the cheerleaders yes. for you know, yes. very specific yes. projects. And the other thing that surprised me about her was her energy, because she's, she's, she's boundless. She's, her energies are boundless. She never... It was fantastic. But, you know, she's 88 years old, right? So, pretty amazing energy. I mean, you know, some people are retired. Or the woman is going, going, going. <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, I had a question, too, about, um, you know, what it's like being a female editor, you know, a female director, you know, in that's not very common, you know, or there are so many who aspire to be, but they don't, their voice isn't heard or they don't get the opportunity because it's such a male-dominated industry. No doubt. Well, <clears throat> when I came up the rank, I was lucky because they were, I think they were giving more breaks to women than they are now. Mm. I don't know why, but in the 80s, I hate using this because it dates me, but here we go. <laughs> you don't have to use it. <laughs> Way back then in the Middle Ages, um, they used to give a sick, you know, because like there was a couple of women who were uh, given breaks who were editing when I was editing, like Carol Middleton, Littleton, and um, you know a few a few women. I think there are less. I look at the movies today; it seems to me we have gone back. I don't know why. Or Dee Dee Allen was. Uh, yeah, but Dee Dee was much older than yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, she was like, she was a god in New York. I was terrified of her, because uh, you know if she said do not hire her, you'd be gone. You see what I'm saying? She was so powerful. So I didn't want to. I didn't want her to know who I was, because you know I, I had that French accent, a blessing and a, and a spell. I was cute, right? I was attractive. Let's put it this way. Very difficult, you know, for people to have around sometimes, right? Right. So I didn't want her to know me at all. Please, Didi, do not know who I am. So then I moved to California. So she. But it was so funny because years later, I was at a Crystal Award, which is a woman award. And I was with my friend Marsha Nasser, who was getting a Crystal Award. And uh, she said, have you ever met Didi Allen? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> she says, oh, let me introduce to Didi, you to Didi Allen. And I'm thinking like, oh, God. You know, she's, even today, people like you say her name, and you cannot say anything negative, right? She's a, one of these people that that you would not dare speak uh, in a bad way. So, I mean, super, super talented. I mean, yeah. she, did, she did the greatest movies. So anyway, so Marsha drags me to meet Didi, and I'm like, oh God, you know, don't know. Didi is a big woman, she was a big woman, and she gave me this sort of handshake that you'd never forget. <laughs> like, really powerful and mm. strong. And, you know, Marsha said, Didi, this is Anne Gourceau. And she goes, I know who you are. She shook my hand like that. Oh, yeah, I've heard of you. And she walked away. <laughs> it was like, oh, my God. what? Because by then I had cut for Coppola, you know, and that was, that was a big deal for a lot of people because I was nobody. Mm. I was nobody. And why she's there? Why, why is this woman cutting a movie for Francis Ford Coppola? There was a lot of hostility within the company. I encountered for women and men. As a matter of fact, it was such a big jump in my career, you know, going from total anonymity to now working for the greatest director on earth. Mm. <laughs> that it was, it was a, in, it, a, the best of time and the worst of time because I felt so lonely. Women did not cheer me up. Women didn't cheer my accomplishment. And men really were unhappy. How did she get there? Did she sleep with them? What's going to happen? Is she going to sleep with them? Is it because she's sexy? She has a French accent. You could feel the hostility. It was very, very, very stressful. And since I was very insecure, of course, I was sucking up all the negative energy. And um, nobody ever said, oh, maybe she got a job because she has talent. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's a hard worker, which I was. 
Never, you know? Yeah. It's very tough. And uh, I used to cry. I used to cry like nobody celebrates women's talent. Nobody is interested in a woman's talent. Not men and not women. So sad. Really sad. And um, yeah, it was a very lonely time. Very, very lonely time. And um, so anyway, so that was one aspect of this. The other aspect was that um, very often I heard that at the beginning of my career, you know, <clears throat> they would say, uh, oh, you, t you should tell the director enough is enough. You should control your director. You women don't know how to do that. You accommodate them too much. You, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, they would make like you feel... Power, uh, yeah. It yeah. would make you feel bad because you are not telling Francis Ford or another guy, listen, this is it. We're done. We're done. We're moving on. You know, did, did Guy do that? Maybe some of them did that. I find a lot of male editors not that strong. <laughs> I, I hardly imagine them telling one of these people, we can. We have to stop. This is it. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. But they would make you feel bad because, mm. you know, again, you would, and you know, women always tend to blame themselves. I mean, I've had assistants, so I know. I watch it. You know, it's not just me. They blame themselves. They immediately think they have done something wrong, uh, even if it's not them. They immediately interiorize. You know, this kind of stuff. Something we have to shake and grow out of as a woman because we we tend to do that about everything. What's something that you've learned over the years about editing, directing, that has stayed with you and that has, um, that has you know, helped you from project to project? And also, what, is, what, what do you think is the proudest um, accomplishment of your career? Well, I learned how to use humor from Jack Nicholson, because he's a master at it, you know? And I will never be as good as he is. <laughs> but, but the idea, because probably when you're directing, uh, you realize immediately that a woman, on, from the top, you know, if you scream to the top of your lung, you're, you're ridiculous. You're absolutely, the, the female voice uh, doesn't work that way, right? It's, you can't have authority that way. It doesn't work. So humor, I learned how to use humor. And I think that's the greatest tool. Not that I, you know, I'm not saying I'm the funniest person in the world, but to, de to, to let somebody know that you're not happy, that's, you use humor. Uh, to, de to, to, you know, remove, relax tension, you can use humor. I mean, you have to be careful because that can turn the tension even more. <laughs> it's a wrong kind of humor. So I think that humor, but really mostly for me, it has been my own personal growth. And learning how to believe in myself. So it's not anybody, it's me having to develop, you know, as a woman, as a foreigner, um, as somebody who comes from, you know, the working class, who has no connection to anything, you know, uh, intellectual or artistic, to develop my self confidence. Um, you know, sure, I always looked like I had a lot of self-confidence. And I always, for some reason, had self-confidence doing my work. I don't know why. Uh, very insecure socially, you know, or I would hide it. But you give me something to do, I can do it. Mm. I can't explain that. That's just the way it is. So it's really, for me, it has been my personal growth. So my proudest accomplishment, I would say I love Dracula. I love Dracula because... I had a, a huge role in making it successful. And also, um, I felt I was like, help, you know, it was like a perfect circle with Francis. He had turned my life around by giving me the biggest break an editor could possibly have. And I came back to help him. And when he contacted me to come, I, I literally I said to him, why me, Francis? I know nothing about vampires. I'm French. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, okay, have you read the novel? I said, no. Okay, you read the novel and I'm sending you my script with the notes. And uh, he was right. I was perfect for that film. It was very creative, you know, because 
just cutting people talking, you know, it's okay and it's wonderful. But this movie was so creative. So for me, there was both a personal um, satisfaction, you know, to, to be able, you know, because I felt always, you know, one from the, the heart was, was a failure and Dracula was a success. And that's a wonderful thing. So I felt very, very good about that. And otherwise, I think that um, I love directing, and I get a lot of satisfaction from that. I think one of the things that um, was difficult for me as an editor was always being in the background mm -hmm. and um, always having to, you know, not, not being able to be fully yourself all the time. Um, and as a director, I, I can totally, you know, I make all my decisions. I love that. Uh, I can be totally myself, you know. I think I'm a, I can be very quiet. That's why I could do editing. But I think, as you can see, I'm very talkative. <laughs> I don't have any problem talking. And I just love being with people. So that aspect of uh, directing, I love. I love being in a group that you really like and working to a common goal. I think this, this is the greatest thing on earth. I really do. And I love doing it for that reason. Just that sense of group and having a, you know, you start, you, you think you have a pretty good idea and everybody comes and is there to accomplish it and help you make it better. It's, there's nothing better than that.